Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are watching. This is Mike Krupa, your great host, friendly neighborhood, Votum TV heretics, leader, host, all around great guy. And today we have a stellar lineup for our discussion about all things Russia, Ukraine, geopolitics with the great Andre Martyanov of the blog Reminiscence of the Future. All the links are in the description box. And Dr. Gordon Hahn, who you can also find on Twitter, and the link to his great blog where he does fantastic analysis, also in the description box. If you are new to our channel, remember to give us a sub, a like, and all the other things that go along with being part of our growing community. I hope you will enjoy us. Our joy our show today and i encourage the chat to uh pose reasonable questions to our guests i hope we can go for about an hour if uh gordon and andre have nothing against uh depending on the questions and the topics but i don't think we'll be running out of that anytime soon okay gentlemen let's dive right into it first of all i want to ask because you both well andre you are russian and gordon you study the russian soul on many levels my question uh is after the, the stunt that the Ukrainians pulled in the Kremlin uh, last week with that crazy drone attack on the Dome of the Senate, a lot of people are asking, are we going to see a Kremlin reaction or are we already seeing a Kremlin reaction? Now, from what I've been observing in the last few years, Vladimir Putin is a cool character. He's not going to allow the Ukrainians to throw a timetable on what he's already doing in Ukraine. So I'm not expecting anything, you know, explosive coming out of uh, Moscow. But I may be wrong. Uh, what can we expect in terms of just this attack on the Kremlin from the Russian uh, authorities? Andre, you can start off uh, with this topic. Well, I think so. You already pretty much covered it, actually. So, and if we're talking about Putin or we're talking about a federal service of uh, Akhrana, which is the uh, prote protection service, which is kind of analog of the American Secret Service, uh, we have to remember those people, I mean, those uh, drones, they have been shut down basically by the electronic warfare means and uh, I just want to only dispel some uh, misunderstanding on the part of many people. They think that they were launched from Ukraine. No, they haven't been. Those are light drones, and most likely they have been launched in the, uh, using not GPS, as many people don't understand. GPS is being jammed in Moscow, primarily around Kremlin, of course. But using the uh, inertial navigation is that reckoning, and for, in order for you to have some kind of degree of accuracy of reaching to uh, some fairly small fixed target, such as the Dome of Kremlin, uh, you need to have, the, it's enough to have the fairly slow flying drone and initial uh, inertial navigation. So it's 50, 60 kilometers. Most likely those drones have been launched uh, near in, from Moscow suburbs, suburbs. And there is a lot of uh, basically assets of uh, Ukraine uh, who are doing this inside Russia. So other than that, you, Mike, you, you were spot on. Uh, Russia is not uh, basically reacting in a knee-jerk manner. So it will be done what's necessary when it will be necessary. And, you know, so we'll, we'll see. So I didn't write a book on the Russian soul, and I still know the Russian soul. Good. I'm a good observer. That's a, you, you that, are. That, you that, are. that gives me comfort. That gives me comfort. Uh, Dr. Han Gordon, what's your take? Uh, should we expect anything we haven't seen already from the Kremlin in relation to this uh, the stunt from the Kiev regime? I think we might see something that we haven't seen, but I think uh, in the at the present, they're trying to um, uh, try to find out exactly what happened, uh, who is responsible. Uh, though they've already accused the Ukrainians, but they might uh, come up with some details. Once they have the details and they are able to present them, if they make an arrest, for example, of uh, some people from a Ukrainian cell near Moscow, uh, and in the meantime, they're probably now deciding what the response will be. And you know, there are several several things they can they can undertake some kind of massive uh, missile attack and then announce afterwards that that was our response. Uh, they might try to take out Budanov, the head of the uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, cool. Secret Ser cool. Services. Yeah. That, that's that's one option. Um, they might do that, uh, not necessarily targeting Kiev, but wait 
uh, for him to uh, journey somewhere away from Kiev and then hit him, uh, you know, basically as part of the war, but uh, as a special upper operation, really. Um, so something along those lines, I wouldn't be, would not be surprised to see. So uh, I would, I would guess because Budanov is the one who made the statement in recent days that uh, they're basically the new mission of the SBU. They're going to be killing Russians all over the world, if I understood it correctly. So, I mean, right. that's, that's even more of a declaration of war on Russia than, you know, that Zelensky made. So <laughs> in my opinion, uh, it would be more dangerous for Budanov to leave the country now uh, than Zelensky. But uh, right. in, in a way, uh, when I spoke to Larry Johnson last week, and we spoke literally an hour after the attack took place, so we had sort of fresh uh, take on the situation, Larry stated that he segued into the topic of this being basically an act of desperation, not only mm -hmm. uh, to comfort themselves sort of psychologically, but an act of desperation to their Western sponsors that, hey, look, we need more equipment. Look how far we can get. So we're not doing the counteroffensive because, and we'll get to that in a minute because the counteroffensive is coming, but it's never coming, but we can do an attack uh, right on the Kremlin. Uh, Andre, mm -hmm. do you think this seems, the smells of desperation on the part of uh, Zelensky and his pals? Oh, it's been uh, the smell of desperation I smelled long time ago, and it's been actually increasing only. There is a desperation. Uh, listen, uh, even uh, um, Mr. Kennedy Jr., I mean, just a couple of days ago, he came up with yet another assessment of the KIAs alone. And he spoke about 315,000 of uh, KIAs on the um, Vesu side, which uh, you easily can multiply by two and three in terms of the sanitary losses, you know, or basically wounded. And most of those people are wounded horrendously. So they're not coming back. So if you look attentively at the numbers, you're looking what about a million casualties by now. So <laughs> they literally have 16, 17 year old kids now uh, basically enlisted. And we are back to the Hitler Jugend almost type situation with, you know, Hitler expecting expecting Wang's army, you know, which he was expecting to the last moment. So, yes, it's desperation because we're looking at the third iteration of the armed forces of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are looking at, uh, uh, again, how to put it politely you know so it's uh, it's the fact that they can now operate and have any kind of the tactical and i stress it tactical not even operational but tactical success it means you know go two three kilometers inside or elsewhere and probably trying to hold to this small territory for whatever the cost will be for them on single operational axis single operational direction they cannot do what they were doing in the beginning because now as uh, mcgregor actually i believe a few days ago he stated the situation is completely inverse you know so in terms of their uh, correlation of forces plus they do not have uh the equipment they do not have hardware which allows you to even accumulate uh minimally required force for any kind of serious operational strategic level offensive so that's simple as that and that's what we're hearing from the uh from the west i mean you've seen the headlines the wall street journal the washington post basically tamping down the expectations as larry yeah. said it's almost like a hollywood production it's coming the counteroffensive is coming it's almost you're waiting for a a, a rating you know pg-13 rated r yeah. Zelensky's offensive but it's not there yet it might come who knows but as of now we're only oh, seeing it will come some way some yeah. way or another but 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 they're yeah. definitely tempering down the expectations. Uh, Dr. Han, how about you? What about your perspective on the fact that this is, as I entitled our talk today, sort of the tide is turning in the sense that desperation is growing in Kiev. Mm -hmm. Let's pull a stunt like the one they did last week. It's it, mm -hmm. it, it has a psychological ramification to it, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's part of, I mean, in part, yes, it's part of, you know, uh, a, a strategy of, uh, of, the, of the week. Um, compensating for other things they don't have, um, and it's uh, the uh, it's so in other words, it's part of a much larger strategy, and we see that, for example, in uh, again, as I think um, uh, Marciano just took, uh, Andre took uh, just mentioned, right? They send a small group of uh, 
insurgents, five or six guys over the border in Bryansk, and they kill a <laughs> they kill a civilian or two. Uh, they fire rockets indiscriminately. They've been doing this for years at Donetsk. Now they're sent. They're targeting uh, places like uh, uh, Bryansk, Belgorod, Kursk, Varano, Varonezh, um, with uh, drones and so forth. Um, I think part of this is to raise the cost and the visibility of the war <clears throat> for the Russian population, in the hope that it will create uh, opposition to the war, and that fits into the whole Western strategy, right, of trying to use the war to uh, weaken Russia and um, undermine Putin's authority and hope hope that there's regime, regime change. So I think it's also part of that larger a larger strategy. And then when you add in now that they're going to be getting these uh, <clears throat> shadow storm missiles from, from England that have a 290 kilo, uh, kilometer range and as I understand that you can, they can be refitted to go 560 kilometers. So that's what uh, 370 or 80 miles. For those of us who need to translate into miles, yeah. people like me. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and that means they can start. They could conceivably hit uh, Moscow or Smolensk. Um, and there's also a terrorism aspect to this, right? I mean, uh, when Budanov says something like, "Where our job is to kill Russians," uh, he didn't say Russian soldiers. He didn't say. Uh, Russian officials and Russian soldiers. He said Russians, you know, and they've already killed three um, um, <clears throat> major non-combatant, uh, no, well, I guess you could call them proper propagandists, Prilepin and Dugin and uh, Dugina and um, uh, the Tatarsky, right, mm -hmm. in terrorist attacks. So, um, again, this is uh, could also be considered part of a larger strategy, right? These drones can be used to, to take out the uh, c civilians, and uh, this is a, a new form of terrorism. You know, before we had ISIS planting bombs uh, in buildings and flying planes into buildings, and now, now we have uh, these guys uh, doing what they're doing. Uh, Dr. Han, I want to stay with you on that. Just a question, because obviously, uh, these types of attacks, obviously, an aspect of desperation is in them to show the Western sponsors yeah, that they're absolutely. doing something that they need more weapon, but. They also would like to see a segment, a growing segment of the Russian population becoming more and more terrorized in essence, because that's the essence of terrorism, to terrorize people. Right. What are your thoughts? You're, uh, you're fairly uh, you know, imbued with the thinking of the average Russian. You know the Russian, so you're a very close observer of uh, Russian political behavior. Do you think if they were to step up such attacks you know, these pinpricks, pinprick attacks, obviously. Uh, but nonetheless, do you think we can expect the sort of public opinion backlash on the part of the Russians, whereby they would say either, which is probably the less feasible option, let's pull back from the special military operation, or there will be more pressure on Putin. Hey, we got to decapitate somebody here. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think it would take many, many years for, for that to, to happen, because uh, for one, the people who would, who would, be, who would lead, uh, you know, an opposition movement um, they've all, most of them have left the country, um, except for the ultranationalists. The ultranationalists, uh, as long as the war is going um, well, uh, probably wouldn't engage in any organized um, efforts. And if they did, they probably have their heads chopped off by the FSB. So I don't think they would get, they would get all that far. Um, but that, again, would take many, many years because um, Putin has general support uh, among uh, more nationalist elements, except the extreme extreme radicals, you know, and, and just because someone's criticizing um, the way the war is be condu being conducted or the strategy, does not mean that one is willing to overthrow um, Putin. When you're when you're making the criticism of the practice of the war from a patriotic point of view, um, you're less likely to be one who's going to try to overthrow uh, uh, someone like uh, Putin. So um, who's considered to be a, a patriot amongst everyone. I think amongst the, you know, the, the uh, average person who's, you know, may not be, be paying a whole lot of attention to the war. Um, uh, I think that would be highly unlikely to happen uh, anytime soon, many, many years. And uh, uh, a scale of destruction um, that uh, an incompetence and visible corruption that would be explaining the incompetence in the war. Uh, all that would need to happen. It's something like a you know a model, say, of uh, 1917, 1917, right? Uh, something like that, sure. Uh, but any regime <laughs> would fall under those circumstances, right? That's it's not all that uh, 
surprising. And that's going to take years to, if it ever <laughs> develops. So, uh, you know, that's a long, that's a long cry away for, for anybody who's thinking along those terms. And that uh, connects nicely with a question that we have for our audience, specifically directed to uh, Andre. You can see it here. Dear Andre, could you comment on the Prigozhin oh, and the God, angry patriots complaints uh, about the Russian traders elite inside the Russian oh, government gosh. bureaucracy? Oh. And this is a question from the Costa Music. So, Andre, can we get your views on the oh, latest oh, controversy I'm in the field? So to say. <laughs> of this. Okay, first, let me explain. Mr. Prigozhin has no operational command of Wagner troops whatsoever. He is not a military man. He is a businessman with a fairly shady uh, background. And again, if people do not understand, Wagner Group is contracted by the Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation. And actually, it's saturated with former officers uh, of the Russian Defense Ministry, of former Russian military people. And they are contracted, and whatever the conditions in this contract described there, uh, they are under operational command of Russian Defense Ministry, of general staff. And Mr. Prigozhin here is merely a media figure. Fact is, some people say, I believe it was Alex Mercurius who said that he is beginning to suffer from PTSD, but my sources, okay, <laughs> and those are sources who are professionals. They say there was no uh, real uh, shell hunger. There is definitely a degree of the tension which ex uh, ex exists always in any kind of operation. And the fact is, Mr. Prigozhin was definitely point, uh, aiming for the larger exposure and media exposure for the future contracts, including on the African continent and elsewhere. He is a businessman. He makes money on basically selling security. Now, I think what he did was absolutely inadmissible. And that is why... That's my speculation. Mr. Mizensev, uh, uh, Colonel General Mizensev, by the way, the guy who took Mariupol, if anybody doesn't know, he has been retired from the uh, armed forces. He is only 60 years old, 61 years old. Uh, he's like me, which is too early for the general of such rank and the person with such position in the general staff. So, and suddenly people see him in Wagner. So make your own conclusion. And nobody says that Mr. Mizensev, who is definitely a highly merited man, who has behind him excellent military pedigree, so to speak, that he was thrown out of the defense ministry. No, he was sent to the pension, so to speak, you know, for a very specific reason. And I would expect that uh, Mr. Shaigu and Mr. Gerasimov, they will have a very specific uh, attitude towards Mr. Prigozhin. And who knows if Wagner actually will exist anymore as we know it today. And in the end, uh, I frankly, being former military professional, sick and tired listening about the fact that Wagner goes ahead and they do this and that. Uh, Wagner is supported by the Russian armed forces. They are great, very courageous people. They are great, probably the best storm uh, group in the world now in terms of their urban combat. But, I mean, uh, that's pretty much the uh, range of the expertise. And obviously, Mr. Prigozhin not only not supposed to, it's absolutely... Uh, absolutely horrible if somebody decides to actually inform Mr. Uh, Prigozhin on the strategy and the operational plans of the Russian general staff, which are, of course, very secret things. And that's what it is. Nobody tries to diminish the effectiveness or heroism or courage of people from Wagner. But Mr. Prigozhin, I think he overstepped. Uh Gordon, what do you think of those who, because just to connect with what Andre said, because there's, I've heard probably rumors going around Telegram, but I'd like to ask these controversial questions because there's a there's a theory going around that what Prigozhin did was maskirovka, that he really wasn't angry. Yeah, yeah. He, he was just trying to knock off balance the Ukrainians. What do you think? 
Uh, I th it seems to me that's a little unlikely. I mean, um, they yeah. could have done that some other way besides yeah. having, you know, someone like Prigozhin screaming at the defense minister yeah. and, the, and the commander in chief of the. And, and showing like, dead bodies in the background, by the way. Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> the thing which. Yeah. <laughs> you Look know, at and, far. And, and, yeah. And really, I mean, this becomes, you know, this becomes, you know, uh, indirect criticism of Putin. And Putin, in addition, Putin's not someone who um, <clears throat> likes this sort of uh, stepping out of line and showing uh, this kind of lack of uh, discipline and and uh, loyalty. And, you know, re recall what, what happened when Kandirov uh, started to criticize the generals. Yeah. We haven't heard a thing from him from in, in a couple of months, yeah. at least. He's been quiet because uh, Putin uh, gave him a call and said, shut your trap. <laughs> and now the fact that I assumed already that that had happened after the first or second outburst by Prigozhin that uh, Putin had made a call and that would be the end of it. The fact that he's doing this again, you know, underscores what, what Andre just said, said that he's stepped over the line. I mean, he's um, especially if Putin had made the call, even if he hasn't, though, this has gone way uh, beyond what that's tolerable. And yeah, uh, it's interesting also in terms of Wag Wagner's future. In uh, the speech on uh, Red Square for the Victory Day, um, Putin mentioned a whole list of different units and formations that were contributing to the to the victory uh, uh, to the to the battle in the, the special military operation in in Ukraine. Didn't mention Wagner. Um, he went through a whole list of ten, I think, ten different. I'm switching into Russian yeah. because I, my family's Russian here, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he didn't mention Wagner. And I think that was uh, that may have been intentional. Intention, yeah, it was definitely intentional. And again, nobody mm -hmm. wants to take anything away from those heroic guys, and they are excellent professionals. Again, they are probably the best storm group in the world right now. They're, uh, I mean, outstanding urban combat people. But uh, the question is not about Wagner. The question is about Mr. Prigozhin, and that again, Mizensov, being an ultimate consummate professional you know, with the excellent combat history behind him. So maybe it's about time that finally somebody from the general staff pedigree became the chief executive officer of Wagner Group instead of some guy who is indeed, I don't know who he is. He's what, catering service or what have you, yeah. you know? So, and he, that's what it is. He seems to have, I mean, I get the impression that he sort of cracked under the pressure because, you know, Probably, I'm not saying the, the, the going was easy, but certainly before they got to the western part of, of Bakhmut, where the Ukrainians were really dug in and they had good fortifications yeah. and so forth because of the building terrain and so forth, um, that they had, a, you know, probably a much easier time, not an easy time, of course, but a much easier time. And when they hit that area, area they probably had a uh, exponential increase in um, casualties. And he probably just, uh, and, and this is from a human point of view, this is understandable. He just, he cracked, you know, he cracked and he's looking for a scapegoat and he does have political ambitions. And uh, he also Not showed- anymore, he also... I think after that, it's pretty much over for him. I'm pretty <laughs> sure because yeah, obviously yeah. as I already stated, then yeah. again, uh, uh, armed forces are built on the subordination and discipline. Right. As my friend Vladimir Trohan, the colonel of the Central Apparatus of Ministry of Defense says, you know, when their, their counter offensive starts, we, everybody knows, and I can only subscribe to every word he says, everybody knows the first line of defense will be where their blood will be shed in, you know, enormous amounts. But it is the way it is. It is the way how it is done. It's a, yeah, there will be many generals and colonels, including general staff, who will be, you know, what, smoking like crazy and just throwing themselves over there you know at the walls because they understand what is going on but they will mm -hmm. also understand that you have to do it because there is no other way of doing right. this you know right. and that's what it is this is the, that's why many military people you know they get uh you know ulcers of stomach they got get you know share heart attacks and things of this nature because especially in the uh conflict of this scale and this complexity and this is why when this uh histrionics begin to you know, uh, be exposed all over the media, uh, apart from the fact that 99% uh, of the Telegram channels is complete trash anyway, you know, so it's primarily, uh, you know, amateurs who basically uh, uh, propagate the rumors, you know, and hearsay about things. And as some people say, the only Telegram channel I watch is the uh, Mr. Kanashenkov. 
uh, Mr. Kanashenkov is the best blogger for me, you know, in the uh, military sphere, you know, so that's the only way to go. And uh, when you look at this, this is, uh, yeah, it's just, it's so way out of proportion. It's just so way media driven and PR driven that it's, I cannot even, uh, I don't have enough vernacular to describe what is going on in this respect. Just forget it. Okay. And I think so, Mr. Prigozhin is done. Mm -hmm. Andre, but but I have to disagree. There's one other good channel that people should follow because I mean the spokesperson of the Russian Foreign Ministry. I mean is just oh yeah, no. so come on. At least the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right? I mean Maria yeah, yeah. kicking ass, yeah. and not taking Maria. names, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, go, so let's stick into Wagner. I'm wondering though because, for example, if we were to redraw the situation. Uh, in February 2022, do you think it was a good idea, in essence, to send Wagner to the battlefield? Or, I mean, I'm an amateur. What what do I know? But maybe if they send Wagner without Prigozhin, the situation might have looked different. Andre, what do you think? I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, there are uh, Wagner is in the operationally subordinated to. Uh, you know, the commander of the upper whole operation. Mm -hmm. And now it is Valery Gerasimov, obviously the chief of the general staff. And uh, if we remove all those political and ideological, you know, intrigue, so to speak, uh, Wagner, as I already stated, they are used primarily in the urban environment. They're great at what they do. In the open field, they won't last for very long. And uh, I totally subscribe to uh, uh, Scott Ritter, who says, yeah, they're a great storm group, but combined arms is a little bit more than that. Actually, it's the whole other world, and Wagner Group is not combined arms warfare unit or formation. Simply not. They don't have the table of organization and equipment TOE, which is designed. That's why they say, oh, we have our artillery. No, they don't have artillery. They, we have our, you know, uh, uh, aviation. They don't have aviation. You know, so that's the whole point. And when you look at this, like, mm, okay. <laughs> so they're good for very specific purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, that, that, would, that would seem to be the case. And uh, no, as Dirty Harry used to always say, no good man always knows his limitations. Good man oh, always yeah. knows his limitations. So uh, we, oh, yeah. we dedicate those words to uh, Mr. Prigozhin and hope he has a good life in the restaurant business and hopefully not all of his restaurants will, will fall. Um, I want to go back to the Potomac now because, um, well, in terms of the coming presidential campaign, uh, there's been an interesting development because as both of you know, we have uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., who is yeah. now uh, running as a Democrat. And that's probably why the Democrats called off the uh, the debates because they don't want Biden to maybe soil himself while uh, yeah. debating with RFK Jr. But I've noticed an interesting trend with him because at least two of his guests that he has had on his podcast after he announced were guests on my podcast also, Scott Reader, Douglas McGregor. So that's a good sign. And I want to get your f opinion, uh, gentlemen, about uh, the difference between what RFK is saying in terms of a fairly deep analysis, at least for an American, on what's happening in Ukraine, despite the fact that his son fought on the side of the Ukrainians. Not too many people know about that. In the Foreign Legion, his son's name is Connor, I believe. But uh, they're, right now, Trump is saying, I'm going to end the war in 24 hours. Okay, I don't know how he's going to do that. God bless him. Robert yes. Kennedy is saying he wants to end the war through deep negotiations with the understanding of Russian national security interests. Basically, he's not saying it directly, but hey, let's go back to those treaties that were proposed in December of 2021. That was a fairly good starting point. Let's treat the Russians seriously. And he has that pedigree behind him, right, of Kennedy and Khrushchev talking during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Ambassador Dobrynin talking with his father, Bobby Kennedy. So I just want to get your opinion on... Um, as, as we stand today, for example, are you seeing the same things that I'm seeing with RFK, that he has a, a deeper understanding than any other candidate, so far at least? And he's basically speaking our lingo in, in many respects as to what is happening in Ukraine and what's uh, what needs to be done with Russia. Gordon, I'll start with you. 
Yeah, I would. Uh, so far, yeah, if we look at, you know, the top four, Biden, Trump, uh, DeSantis, uh, and uh, Kennedy, DeSantis uh, doesn't seem to uh, really have uh, any clear foreign policy as of yet. Maybe he has one, but he certainly hasn't spoken about it. Uh, he made some positive uh, comp from our point of view, <laughs> views about, you know, trying to uh, saying that Ukraine was not a vital national interest for the United States, but then he was forced to back off on that. Uh, Trump, you know, he's usually as shooting, he's shooting his mouth off as usual. Um, his, uh, his heart, I guess, is, is in the right place. He wants to, he, he wants to, he would want to end this war and wouldn't, and would have done everything to, uh, avoid it. And, uh, if you look at Biden, well, he's just, uh, clueless, clueless and being manipulated by other people. Uh, <clears throat> One thing that uh, so he I think I think you're right that Kennedy has got the uh, the, uh, the deepest understanding of of, of the problem uh, that we um, that we face absolutely um, yeah that's about uh, all I have to say Andre well I agree with Gordon there's very little to add in this respect except for of course Mr Trump because the moment if if Trump is elected, he will uh, appoint national security advisor, somebody like John Bolton. In fact is, we might end up back again with John Bolton for the only reason that John Bolton is tough talking guy. And hey, we might get back uh, Mr. Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis, because he looks good in the uniform. And he reminds uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Patton. I mean, so yeah, I don't take Trump seriously in any way anymore. So the guy had his chance and he blew it so bad. Badly. I mean, it's like, it's horrible. Uh, uh, Robert, I mean, he is, seems to be very, uh, you know, common sense in many respects, definitely. And even the scientist, he made a very good uh, overtures, but he was immediately slapped down by neocons. They immediately twisted his hands and that was it. It is the problem with the, um, and here we have to go to a little bit, uh, how to put it politely. Uh, Gordon might not like it, what I say, because, but I know his excellent books, you know. But the point is that I am on the record. You can quote me, and I'm on record for the last 10, 10 years, that uh, American Russia study field is non existent. It's basically a field of the shysters, uh, frauds, <laughs> academic frauds, and people who, and so that automatically, especially when it combines with the fanaticism and Russophobia of neocons, that's the level of American diplomacy and American foreign policy understanding in, uh, in relation to Russia. Then you add here that overwhelming majority of those people, be them in Congress, be them in State Department, or be them in Pentagon, they have no clue what modern war is. And mm -hmm. then there you go. You have this disaster in the making. And will the even the most well-wishing and do-gooding, uh, you know, uh, American president, uh, if elected, help in this respect? I don't know. It's some people call it deep state, and in reality, it's the completely corrupted bureaucracy. And how do you go against it? When Putin was going against what was happening in Russia, he still he came from, don't forget who he was, he was director of the FSB. And he had a, he also huge connections in the uh, Foreign Intelligence Service too, SVR. Mm -hmm. And evidently he also had a huge support from military counterintelligence. So he had a serious base. But how, what do you do in the United States where you have FBI, CIA, all those working against you? What are you going to do? There you go. That's the difference. Uh, if you guys uh, visit Andre's website, Reminiscence of the Future, I think a few weeks back, Andre did a video, Why They Lose. And I found it fascinating that you put quotes there of, uh, I think Gantz is the author, about the myths of the German-Soviet war. And yeah. I, found those, I found those quotes fascinating because uh, I'm not a military historian. I'm a historian by trade. Now I'm finishing my PhD in political science. I know I'm the I'm the exception in your book, Andre. Um, but <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it it does seem that if you connect the attitude, I mean, what Ursula von der Leyen was doing in Kiev, for example, and promoting that idiotic notion of Europe Day, and we're going to defend democracy, and obviously taking into consideration where she hails from and her ancestors and what they did in those crucial years, 1939 to 1945, we all know what we're talking about here. Um, 
if you combine that with the historical ignorance whereby, and I was very much taught this even way back when I was in high school, that the only reason the Russians are moving forward during World War II and moving, you know, along the Belarusian Ukrainian fronts is because they had guys and NKVD guys with rifles behind them. So you had a whole front basically being pushed by the uh, special services, which kind of seemed outlandish to me at the time. But, you know, you accepted it because, I mean, it's the Russians. Or, it's the Russians, right? Um, but I had a look at that book, Andre. I, I, I downloaded it. I had a look at the PDF. And wow, I mean, it it is an eye opener. And I have to say that your conclusions about uh, the ignorance on of military affairs combined with this historical mentality that has been passed down during the Cold War and after that, yeah, we know that, you know, if the Germans only held out a little bit longer, it would have been done. Well, it turns out that's complete BS. So it's it's an ideological uh, it's an ideological possession, in my opinion, but based on a sincere, sincere misunderstanding of history that Gantz talks about in his book, for example, and you alluded to in your video. Uh, do I make the right combination here? Oh, absolutely. And just to demonstrate uh, two days ago, Karine Jean-Pierre or whatever the name of this uh, poor girl is, she comes out and she stands that the United States and the lies defeated Nazi Germany, you know, so. And Russia is aggressor. The girl doesn't even understand, for example, what it means when you lose out of 150 million, 27 million, and 17 million of them are civilians. And you do it in four years. People have no concept. Stad Sterkel wrote an excellent book, you know, The Good War, where he described this lady in 1980 in Washington, D.C. For, for her, it was all show of Hollywood, you know. And uh, what can I say? You cannot break it, you know. It's, just, it's cultural. And again, I am on record. You can quote me again. Most of people who are produced through the American humanities education, so to speak, are extremely uncultured people. You know, you take any, practically any political scientist from the United States, they literally have no clue. I remember people being praising, you know, basically, well, I'm not going to go to Fukuyama because he became an absolute butt of all jokes the moment he published his treatise, which was unreadable anyway, you know, but you look, look who teaches here. It's a former Nazis, and when you know, you know, if you go from the paper operation paper clip and you go to the commission by uh, Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman when they opened those archives, how the Gellin and his orc was basically fooling those Americans, you know, uh, sincerely believing they believe that you know those Russian Iwans are just about to break through into you know just kill the democracy and all that and uh, this continued for so many years now and you have when you have Brzezinski teaching geopolitics what do you expect apart from the fact that the guy was totally illiterate but point is that I mean what do you expect what results do you expect these are the I mean American elites today and now finally Russians and Russian Americans begin to notice what I wrote for I don't know how many years, very many. The intellectual decay and intellectual, it's precipitous. It's catastrophic. It's like literally you had people the scale of James Baker or Ambassador uh, Jack Matlock. Jack Matlock spoke better Russian than many Russians and he knew Yevgeny Onegin. All of it. All the whole poem, you know. And then you have what we have today, it's like how you even communicate with those people. They are just. And Matt Luck, I think, was also the guy who was uh, translating the cables coming from the White House in the American embassy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, if I got that right, I think. I don't mm -hmm. know about that, but possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's there, just, there, there uh, you go. So dovetailing with that, Gordon, because not only do we see an ignorance of what really happened during World War II in terms of the military affairs, but you've written extensively. And uh, yes, good shameless promotion here. If you haven't read Dr. Han's great book, The Russian <laughs> Dilemma, I am just beginning. Trust me, well worth your time. Uh, I, I, for example, Gordon, have an experience with this in Poland where I say, listen, you might not agree with why the Russians are vigilant. You might dismiss it, but you can't dismiss that it's there. 
Mm -hmm. And a lot of the responses here, especially coming from what, what I call the, uh, I call him lately the Polish Baghdad Bob of Russian disinformation. His oh, name yeah. is Stanislav Zarin. He has the title of Plenipontary of the Government for Combating Disinformation. But he's literally a Baghdad Bob type of guy. He just, you know, smart people make fun of him. But those type of people believe that, no, not even the feeling of caution or vigilance is real in the Russians. That's all maskirovka. That's all fake. They're, they want you to believe that they're afraid for their security. Mm -hmm. How do you talk to people like that, Gordon? How, yeah, how yeah, do you address I, I, it, 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 part of this, uh, uh, I don't know how to talk to them. I can only uh, connect, uh, do a little bit more analysis of the problem connected to what Andre was saying. Um, a big part of the problem in terms of political science and the, the diplomacy and the country as a whole, uh, speaking of the United States, is uh, um, a complete uh, lack of interest and knowledge of history. And um, if you uh, delve into Russian history, in any uh, significant de detail, and you look at Russian culture, and you look at the way they talk about their history in the arts and literature, you quickly come to realize that um, uh, suspicion of the West, um, uh, fear of the West, uh, a long history of uh, political uh, interference in Russian politics coming from the West, military invasions, military interventions, and so forth and so on, beginning... Uh, you know, even before the the smuta with the Poles sponsoring the false Dimitri and so forth, going through Napoleon, uh, through the world First World War, Hitler and so forth, anybody with half an ounce of uh, brain matter would have understood that you were just setting off a time bomb by expanding NATO, and you just couldn't talk about that with people. I mean, you I mean they it just didn't register. It does not register with these people. Um, and part of that has to do with the, um, the the despoiling of political science where everybody studies a very narrow issue, usually connected with um, either something like rational choice or theory or uh, democratization. Um, how many times I got into conversations with other political scientists about um, uh, the fact that the world was destined, you know, the Fukuyama idea, and that was deeply entrenched throughout political science that... Uh, the world was destined, uh, <laughs> kind of like the Bolsheviks believed the world was destined to become communist. These people believe the world was destined to become a uh, democratic, that it was a rational choice, that all human beings are rational. Um, and there was no sense that people can become what they would call irrational, um, but th they're not being irrational. Obviously, the Russians are not being irrational. They look back on their history and they draw certain conclusions and certain lessons. Uh but uh, these people just would would would, would not uh, would don't want to deal with it. And um, my recommendation for political science departments would be that um, uh, at least for uh, you know if you're going to go for your master's degree or PhD in um, political science, that you should have majored in history or you should have a master's degree in history first. Amen. Uh, because uh, without a grounding in history, you can't possibly and 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 history i don't mean just the history the facts i mean understanding the culture of the other countries this has yeah. been lost this has been lost in um diplomacy you know you compare uh uh compare the the present dipl diplomat with someone like george cannon uh yeah. for example um, and even he for all his brilliance he made number of serious miscalculations to put it mildly but at least the guy uh, he had a systemic knowledge. That's what uh, uh, I would say. Get a systemic knowledge of things, you know. But uh, listen, I late uh, Angela Codevilla's last book, you know, The Rise, Rise and Fall of America. He, there is an absolutely magnificent introduction to it where he states, God bless his soul, that the rest of the world does not is not impressed anymore with Western pedigrees and degrees. Mm -hmm. They just ignore it because it's became it lost its shiny, you know, appearance. It's basically nowadays it's very often is disqualifying things, you know. Like uh, I remember I was reading that there are a number of them. Uh, I'm reading the, what they write, especially in foreign affairs or mm -hmm. elsewhere. Those 
the scientists so to speak about issues of military strategy forget about operational art and then forget about military technology you have to have the serious engineering background to even understand that and yet here we are we have those people just you know running amok and it's it's non-stop doctrine mongering it's mm-hmm. on and on and on and they do this basically on uh basically that uh, type of education or credentials became the basically shuffling or reshuffling the facts or juxtapositioning them to feel their uh narrative and that's about it that's the mm-hmm. only thing they do what they don't like they just remove and yes. there you go there's narrative and uh, then uh i uh, actually a couple of years ago i made this fundamental decision for myself and because you cannot break through them like on the reasonable rational basis you cannot prove that well it's uh, you know uh, what a Kruger effect you know like you cannot prove to an idiot that he's an idiot because he's an idiot you know and so the only thing you can go is to what they were doing on their part for decades you have to go at hominem Mm-hmm. You have to not go into the, for example, Mr. Kagan, for example, this ideologue, he's mm-hmm. militarily illiterate, you know, mm-hmm. so you have to point out the guy doesn't know, I mean, part my friend, one thing from Shinola, you know, so, and yet those people create the like Institute of the, uh, you know, study, study of war. Of war yeah. yeah, Mr. Petraeus wouldn't be allowed to command freaking regiment in Russian, modern Russian armed forces. He will fail at that too. This is the guy who lost everything he ever fought and they consider so and you have to point this out constantly and when you begin to talk show me the winning record of the united states army where is it show me and this is the same as- uh, we have to be a little bit careful about throwing out the entire field of political science because i mean um, oh, no, no, I was not talking about political science here. <laughs> I was talking about the ideologues who derived yeah, the idea, the ideologues, yeah. But many of them aren't even science, they're not political scientists. And uh, some of them are, some of them are, are trained political scientists, but but you know, they've been sidetracked by careerism and and other uh, other things. I mean, because there, there are a wealth of uh, theories in political science that would p- support you know our, uh, our more uh, historical approach to trying to understand. Russia's national security interests and the way they look at the world and and so forth. Uh, so, I mean, there is something there. The problem is that th- those theories are um, given short shrift, and those who either use the popular theories and, and uh, uh, apply uh, the popular theories to the present day world and then do that in a way that supports um, policy, they're the ones that whose careers uh, move forward rapidly, and those who don't. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem. It's a, it's a conjunction of of, of, of of things, failures in political science, uh, a lack of history, corruption, intellectual corruption in the country at large. I mean, I think a lot of this is going on in, in, in many, many fields in the United States, it's in law, in, uh, yeah. in business, in business, you know, where you have, you know, 40, I remember reading a poll a few years ago, 40% of the uh, MBA students graduating saying their main task was to um, social engineer. Yeah. I it's mean, a systemic, what, what, yeah, what, it's a systemic what, issue. It's a systemic yeah. issue. And, and uh, everyone look, finds employment in the State Department after, right? Yeah, <laughs> and again, for neocons, uh, the, yeah, the only thing about war they know is they write nonstop all those history of the Peloponnesian Wars. And my question always <laughs> is the same. And how do you apply those galleys to the modern net centric warfare? And the decision making, uh, uh, decision three for, for example, political uh, uh, top of such country uh, or United States or Russia, nuclear superpowers. How's that relates, you know, to the ancient, you know, Greece and those stories? How do you even apply those, you know, things? Are you thinking of anybody in particular? Maybe Victor Henson Davis? <laughs> yeah, or there are many. Uh, uh, there are many. And at this point of time that, you know, after so many years trying to argue it in any kind of, you know, common sense and reasonable manner, you say, you know what? Uh, screw that. I'm done with this. You know, I don't want to go there anymore. Uh, you are a fraud. You are a fraud. It's mm-hmm. the same as like, uh, you know, uh, as I already stated, Mr. Petraeus, 
as a, it, he is this this whole cabal of those generals who lost every single freaking campaign they ever fought because they are so uh um, well and again i am on record now and again you can quote me the military which worships Patton, who is primarily media figure blown out of proportion and you know what do you expect how do you expect it to perform when mm-hmm. those people do not read real strategies, evidently, after we'll see what is happening, for example, in the uh, academy at the West Point, they wanted to reduce it to the three-year college because they cannot pull off even basic math there, let alone serious engineering sciences, you know. So they wouldn't even pass in at any combined arms warfare college in Russia. Mm-hmm. They won't be able to enter it because uh, actually they even there what SAT ACT is just not enough, you know. Let alone if you go into the uh, more serious uh, military engineering schools, in naval academies, air force academies. Uh, how do you even produce them? And then that's the kind of people who go in, and that's the p- kind of people who today constitute American elite. They literally do not know what they are doing. And mm-hmm. there is always the issue with the economics, but that's the whole other story. It's uh, Michael Hudson um, is my guiding light here. So it's yeah. well, like, uh, the, think, like the businessman who uh, the businessmen, women who um, who think uh, that their main task is not to make a, a profit or the, uh, the lawyer who doesn't think that his main task is to protect the law or a judge who doesn't think it's his main task is to uh, implement the laws it's written and um, under the constitution we have you know military men now who are studying uh, critical race theory i mean yeah that, that says it all it says it absolutely it says everything about the direction the country is going well it was general milley right who said uh while testifying in congress i want to find out about the rage of the white man and i want to <laughs> explain it and he said with all the sincerity in his face just like the sincerity uh, a few months back where he was saying that, yeah, Russia is getting its butt kicked and the Ukrainians are advancing and it's just a matter of time. But then he switched again. But that's what happens with shills who work in the Pentagon. But I think coming from a political scientist, I think one of the main issues that that we have is, first of all, we have political scientists who easily transform in the, into ideologues, which is fairly easy when you're dealing with political doctrines because a lot of them are mm-hmm. utopian and are destined in and of themselves to make mm-hmm. people yeah. think in utopian terms. And mm-hmm. neoconservatism, which I studied in and out, and we can talk for hours about neoconservatism and its history, is just the perfect ideology, right? Because it doesn't ground the American historical experience in American, in American historical experience, but in abstracts, you know, universal democracy, mm-hmm. egalitarianism, uh, Israel yep. is the best friend of the United States, mm-hmm. Russians are barbarians, we mm-hmm. got to bring Coca-Cola to all those babushkas in Eastern Europe, that is the mission yeah. of neoconservatism. It's, so, so, so that's, that's one problem, but I mean, as, as Dr. Han alluded, we have many great political scientists who grounded their theories because they were first grounded in reality, and that even if you're creating a specific political system or an economic system, if you're based in reality and you don't have your head up your, you know what, or in the clouds or some nefarious intentions going for you, like uh, let's bring democracy to the Middle East and let's have Halliburton in the background. And I think you have a whole different genre of, uh, of, of political scientists, basically, and one that I think even Andre could respect. I think he's Mm -hmm. looking at one right now, by the way. So yes, I do. And I, I Shameless self-promotion. I know. Yeah. I'm, I, I know. need to talk to you on Strauss, on Leo Strauss. I am working <laughs> on my fourth book. And uh, yeah, I would love, listen, Pipes is one thing, but Strauss is the whole other, and I need your advice. No problem. Le- le- legendary Leo, indeed. Um, but going back to uh, perceptions, because I think this perception game played out beautifully last year, because I'm going to give you this analogy, gentlemen. You probably know this German movie, Das Boot, about this great German undersea boat. It was made in West Germany. I think it was 83. It's like a three-hour movie. Um, If you don't like German and you don't like war movies, don't watch it because you'll fall asleep. Like I love Jürgen Prochnow, but I love him for the Lynch reasons, David Lynch reasons. So (laughs) there's a connection there, you know. Amen. But remember how the captain of the U-boat looked at the very beginning. He was all nicely dressed. They all had smiles on their faces. They were shaved. That's sort of an analogy of NATO circa February 2022. Guys, we're going to get this done. It's going to be a couple of weeks. It's going to be a hard slog, but the Russians are going to fly back to Moscow. Putin's going to fall. We got this. We got Mm -hmm. this. And then fast forward three hours later to Das Boot, 
where the captain is all bloody, doesn't know what the hell is going on, his base is being bombed, people are dying all around him. And that is exactly where I see the Atlantic Alliance today, or what's called the Atlantic Alliance. And it's beautiful because I, I, I long for the day when all of that will collapse, but the analogy is perfect. And since we're on the topic of the NATO alliance, I'm thinking the Ramstein meeting that took place, or is still taking place, mm -hmm. where they uh, were, which Zawujna claimed he couldn't attend, uh, might be the last one, uh, because I'm sensing that with the ground becoming more and more uh, dry as we in, yeah. in eastern Ukraine, I'm thinking that we're going we're gonna to see something. I'm just getting this tingly feeling in my body that we're going to see something, something unexpected. So, uh, Gordon, what do you think? Uh, are you are you having that tingling feeling also that uh, more things are going to be flying from east to west with a boom at the end? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the Ukrainians are basically being forced to undertake something that will look like they can, they can claim looks is a counteroffensive because Biden is uh, hoping and praying that he can pull... Uh, is you know what out of the fire before the elections because if this whole thing collapses anywhere um close to the elections uh then he's got a additional problem he's gonna have to falsify the vote a little bit more than than last time um but i think what's going to happen likely is they will try to do something uh somewhere and the russians will let them come destroy uh you know i'm not a military expert but in general terms watching what's going on um I think they'll continue the strategy of letting the Ukrainians come at them uh, and they'll pick them off very carefully using, uh, you know, the intelligence satellites and their drones and everything else that they're using. They won't make frontal assaults as the Western media claims they're constantly doing and throwing away, allegedly throwing away tens of thousands of lives. And when um, it looks like the Ukrainians are to the greatest, uh, the weakest point uh, uh, possible, they're, they're going to uh, undertake a major uh, offensive, the Russians are into uh, at least one or two of the either south or the east. I don't expect that they're going to try anything again from Belarus or uh, even uh, in the direction of Sumy and so forth, um, unless it's necessary or there's some opportunity opens. But I think uh, they'll stick with the goals of liberating what, what they were once calling Nova Russia, keeping the land bridge to Crimea and taking Donetsk and um, that shouldn't be too difficult to do. They might go to the Dnieper uh, if, if necessary, and then become then then, then the whole question arises of will the Poles and the Ukrainians pull that little uh, trick of <laughs> removing the Polish-Ukrainian border, incorporating you know, temporarily incorporating Ukrainian to, to Poland, so they can move either uh, Polish or NATO forces into Western Ukraine, and then dare the Russians to uh, do something stupid. Um, that's what I, 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 the general lay the land as I see it, but uh, Andre probably has a better idea. Andre, take well, away. pretty much you are correct. You know, the only thing which remains strategically, it's the most important bridge between Transnistria and uh, uh, what is Novorossia right now already. So, and that means obviously this line of Kherson, Nikolaev, and Odessa. Uh, in terms of uh, Poland, first, if Pol Poland would have been more agreeable or more amicable, I think so by now this issue of the Vostochny Kresy or basically the of Lvov, which is traditionally Polish, you know, land and uh, would have been solved very amicably behind the curtains. The problem is, of course, that uh, Polish uh, the political top is so uh, aggressive and so, uh, you know, well, Russophobic, let's put it this way, that uh, they make it very difficult for themselves. And if we remember also Churchill, remember before Dunkirk and France, you know, falling, remember what was proposed to them. Churchill declared on the radio that, you know, Great Britain and France now are the unified state, if you remember this in, 19, mm -hmm. in 1940. Well, did it help much? No. Will Poland push the troops uh, into there to meet Russian troops? If Russians decide, now uh, they might try, not going to end up well, but still. And the point is, we have now, by different estimates, between six and seven hundred thousand Russian troops strung along the border, basically along the front line, and where this mass will move with this. And we know there is a huge uh, number of the arm. Uh, I mean, quantities of armor. There are new 
you know, uh, units in the Air Force. So when it will go and start moving, maybe once the and Russians were always great at counter offenses. Rem remember Stalingrad, remember Kursk, rem well, except for the Operation Bagration, that was the thing which Russians did fully offensively. But point is that, uh, yes, you're absolutely correct. Let them go in, let them impale the remnants of their reserves. And they have about different uh, different estimates between 70 to 100,000 reserves. You know, so what it takes, uh, it takes them to meet something like second tank army and they will be done pretty fast and uh, after that who knows it's uh, it's political thing in russia military strategy is completely subordinated to the strategy of the state which is formulated of course by the politicians but uh, russian politicians are pretty good in terms of understanding of the military affairs and security issues and in terms of strategy putin himself is seen when he told Gerasimov when he visited the central command post of the special military operation, he said, hey, I'm here for a very short time. You do your thing, you know? And that wasn't the show off. This is how it, it's done. Yeah, I think one, one in fact, I can just interject one final thought um, um, on that. Um, one way we can kind of uh, get at measuring um, to the extent to which this Ukrainian counteroffensive is going to be successful <laughs> or not is if we look at Bakhmut, uh, according to um, according to Ukrainian data, they lost uh, th um, 30 tanks and 90 uh, um, APVs in the course of three months around Bakhmut. And the Western assistance for this offensive amounts to 200 tanks and 300 APVs, armored personnel vehicles. So do the math. I mean, just around Ma Bakhmut, 30 tanks and 90 APVs lost. And we've and the West has only given 200 tanks and 300 BMPs. So how this can make some major difference in the war when you, as uh, Andre said, you know, there are uh, 600,000 uh, troops ready, ready to go into action with the T-92 tanks still having not been used, with air superiority, with the Russians having uh, dug in, prepared for the for the Ukrainian offensive and in and, and good position to exhaust it once it starts. I uh, just don't see any prospects for you for, you, for Ukraine making any serious headway, and and the, and the tragedy is that probably there are very very many people in, in in Western capitals who know this, and they're just throwing away Ukrainian lives in the case of the White House, so that uh, Biden has a better chance of getting reelected. Yeah, so yeah, that's what it comes down to. That's what it comes down to in the end. And somebody because if Biden wins or whoever controls Biden wins, this is writing off all those huge sums of money, which have been, much of it have been stolen, obviously misappropriated, and then obviously used in the most bizarre way. So, Gordon, you absolutely nailed it. This is what it comes down to. Uh, Ukraine is the America's internal affair. And mm -hmm. this is America's internal affair due to American elites not understanding modern economy, not having the measure, sense of scale. You literally mm -hmm. can take, give me Richard Haas of this, uh, what is this, Council for Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. He would know, he has no clue what Russian economy is. He doesn't even understand the scale. When mm -hmm. you tell those people, guys, do you know that Russia produces as much steel as the United States? They're like, what? Yeah. Uh, Russian shipbuilding just dwarfs American one. And it's like you continue to go it. And I'm not talking about China. China produces 12 times more steel than United States and three times more cars than the United States. Mm -hmm. And those people still, they still don't understand what is going on out there. You know, they just have no clue. And that is why, as you correctly stated, they expected Russia to collapse in two weeks or as uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, or was it Baerbock? She said, now Putin cannot shop in Paris. <laughs> that will show him. Those well, idiots, they haven't been to Russia lately, I would say. Yeah. Well, it, like most men, I think he has very little interest in shopping in Paris. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, we'll, that... we'll leave the shopping in Paris to Zelensky's wife. She's pretty good at yeah, that. So oh, yeah, she's doing big time um, shopping but, there. Yeah. 
G- gentlemen, we're, we're, we're over an hour, and I want to thank you once again for your time, but I'll leave it off with this last question because we talked about the dragon in the room, so to say. We talked about China. Now, if what Gordon is saying is right, and I tend to believe that, yeah, in essence, this is becoming an internal American affair, and the question of scale and misunderstanding, I might have believed differently from what Andre said if they, for example, a quest to the peace deal that was ready to sign in Istanbul last year. He said, okay, wow, mm-hmm. that was stupid on our part. We're not going to do anything like that again. We learned our lesson in Afghanistan. We're not going up against Russia. Let's get this over with. But, I mean, this is going on for over a year. So it's, it's, it's hard for me to believe that even a constructive engagement on the part of the Chinese will convince the West to back down because why would it? Why would it no, after a year? No. I mean, this, despite the best intentions of the Chinese, they're just going to say to themselves, oh, it's a despot trying to help a despot. We're not going to question this. We're going to keep on going and keep on going. Mm-hmm. What do you think of my line of thinking, Andre? Oh, absolutely. And uh, hopefully China understands now that you cannot negotiate with those people. You just can't. And again, uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. You cannot explain to idiot that he's an idiot because he's an idiot. You just cannot do that. You know, you, there's nobody to talk to in Washington. Who? Show me the person. This boy Blinken. The guy has no clue, honestly. You know, who else? I mean, there's nobody. Well, we're not talking about Mr. Biden, who is lost in space-time continuum. You know, and. You know, but point is, it's Washington became a joke actually. And if not for them being monkeys, monkey with the grenade, you know, that would have been laughable. However sad it is that the once great country have been reduced to this freaking circus. You know, it's a freak show basically. Yeah, I think there's very little uh, hope. The only maybe. Hope would be that be some kind of contradictory, <laughs> perfect storm in which you know the Russian, the American economy um, collapses, which it very well uh, might, and the Ukrainian uh, army is on is on the verge of being completely routed, and the Chinese are are, are pushing for a peace treaty, and um, some people from the uh, Western alliance have have broken ranks and begin to support it, like uh, say the French, you know the Hungar- Hungarians are easy to imagine. Uh, and others, and they're supporting the idea of a, a peace agreement. And and, Z- and Zelensky is hedging because the army is getting routed. Um, I can imagine in that circumstances that the these uh, lying skunk Democrats would suddenly turn around, face uh, 100 180 degrees, and say, "Okay, we're for a peace treaty. Um, we were always for peace, and look at how excellent we are that we've achieved peace." <laughs> and then wow. on the base, on the on the base of their on the basis of their control of the media. Um, they would hope by doing this that they could actually win and their control of uh, mail-in voting and so forth and so on. They would they would hope that they would uh, actually be able to win. So that's that's the only way I can see this thing turning around is that they, they reach for peace as a last straw to save Biden uh, in some kind of, you know, like I said, contradictory, self-contradictory uh, about face. No, they will do, Gordon, uh, Annalena Baerbock turn around. They will turn around 360 degrees <laughs> and will end up in the same position. <laughs> so, well, she is geometrically challenged woman, so she's challenged on many other respects, too. So, <laughs> Indeed. Well, I'm, uh, from what I'm seeing and from my vantage point, I they say that the... Uh, Mm, that a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. Optimist, so, yeah. So <laughs> uh, I think I, I would tend towards what Andre said, although I do believe that uh, the Democrats, the uh, the regime right now in Washington is, I mean, if you have Kirby saying we left Afghanistan and nothing really happened, we were said mm-hmm. that at a press conference, what mm-hmm. else can you say, right? I mean, say anything. I, I, I can see them saying, hey, listen, we sent them the weapons. They didn't know how to use them. We told mm-hmm. Zelensky not to do the counteroffensive. We told him to leave back. Would he yeah. listen? It's his fault. It's, uh, you know, Afshan Ghani. We told him uh, to tell the television cameras that you, I mean, both Biden said in July in that phone call with him, he said, even if it's not true, you have to keep the narrative going that you will hold back the Taliban and that everything is great. It's literally in a Reuters report. So I can imagine what's happening on the lines between Washington and Kiev right now. Uh, I would tend towards more what Andre said. But I would not discount the stupidity of uh, of the Democrats and the arrogance and the evil literally telling people, hey, we got this. As a matter of fact, we won this war because Putin wanted to go all the way to the Polish border and we That's stopped right. him. Yeah, the and we, so there yeah. you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, and screw and the Chinese also, along the way. Also, yeah. We can also say one more thing. They can say, 
we gave them the weapons, but the Ukrainians, being essentially Russians, were too too stupid to make good use of them. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. There will be, well, there's so many possibilities here. Oh, my gosh. It's incredible. Exactly. Well, we'll, we'll be watching the developments. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, it was a really deep dive discussion. We will certainly do it again if you find the time for our audience here on Votum TV Heretics. Remember, guys, to check out Andre's and Gordon's websites. And Gordon is also on Twitter. Uh, you can check out his, his Twitter account, which I highly recommend. Give us a like, give us a sub, give us a follow. It helps our work expand. And hopefully we'll be seeing you soon. Oh, I can already announce that 11 on Saturday. That's 11 Polish time. So you do the math in terms of American time. We'll be hosting Laurie Spencer, the independent blog. We'll be talking about all things RFK, Kennedy, and possibly touch upon the Kennedy's historic legacy, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. Gentlemen, once again, thank you for your time. It was a great honor uh, and hope to see you soon. Hunter was out. Thank you very much. Gordon, pleasure. Mike, nice you, you. Uh, you, uh, I, I kind of catch you by your word. Strauss, I will need the Strauss lecture, okay? <laughs> no problem. Strauss yeah, me an email and we'll have a talk. Yeah, yeah, because I cannot read the guy. I My blood begins to boil and, you know, so it just, yeah. I need somebody intermediary who can kind of deliver the software to me. No <laughs> Make problem. excuses for him. Make excuses, yeah. exactly. <laughs> okay. Have a good okay, one, guys. guys. Take care. It was a pleasure. Take uh -huh. care now.